Welcome to my talk. This is uh, going to be joint work with people at Meta. Um, Randall, who's here as well, um, Yu Bei Chen, Seth Lloyd, my advisor, and Jan LeCun. So the basic goal of this work is to take all these really uh, neat and interesting algorithms in the self-supervised learning uh, area of machine learning and translate them into kernel methods. Uh, just before I begin the talk, I will say this has a lot of nice ties to manifold learning, metric learning, um, things that we, I'm sure a lot of people here have used before in kernel methods. So we're looking at the joint embedding framework where the basic idea is you want to learn in an unsupervised fashion, but you have some information which relates um, images or inputs. So here we look at augmentations, and there's two different ways to do this type of learning. The first is contrastive, where you, um, you know, augment an image, and then you match the uh, representations for pairs that you know come from the same augmentation or same original image, and then you push away or um, contrast those that are uh, not related. And then uh, perhaps more recently, there's been a line of work that's uh, along the lines of non-contrastive methods, where you also match representations, but you don't want to do any um, negative pairs. So instead, to avoid collapse, to avoid pushing everything to a constant, uh, these ideas maximize information. So they ensure that the uh, information of your representation is in some sense uh, not lost, and that avoids this collapse issue. Um, so just to give a brief idea of how this works in deep learning, you have a original input, you uh, produce two different augmentations of it or two different views of it, and then in the, um, you push these through your neural network and then in the downstream task you apply your loss function. Um, so um, people here probably already know this, but uh, our goal is to take this whole idea and show that you can do a lot of the same techniques in the kernel regime. Um, instead of uh, using a deep network, we're here going to say we put our um, input and we do augmentations where it may be, but then we embed it into some Hilbert space. Uh, and then we want to do everything inside that Hilbert space. We want to take these self-supervised learning algorithms and um, reproduce them uh, using techniques from kernel methods. Okay, um, so um, just to reiterate the point, you, uh, the main goal here is we want to um, take our inputs, put them into Hilbert space, and then output some linear map from this Hilbert space into some representation space. Here, um, we treated that as R to the K, so the real, it's just a vector in K dimensions. Um, and then this produces a new um, induced kernel, which is the output of your self-supervised learning algorithm. Uh, and you can use this new, what we call induced kernel for whatever downstream task you'd like, um, be it uh, regression or classification, whatever uh, you may choose. So in a broad sense, our, our main goal is to just find what is this, uh, what we call this induced kernel or K star in my notation uh, that takes your uh, original kernel and does some, trains it on some self-supervised task and produces a new representation. Um, so uh, here's our kind of pipeline. So basically we have some set of data set, x1 to xn. We have some adjacency matrix, which encodes the relationships between inputs. Here I put a, a orange color wherever we know that two inputs are related by an augmentation. But you could be more broad, general than this. You could have some um, manifold of data, and uh, you could maybe define a Laplacian or whatever it may be. These, these things also fit. Um, but here in the finite case, we have some input data set. We, we know relationships between the data that are encoded in this adjacency matrix. And we want to use this data to produce a new kernel. Uh, just to be very uh, precise, just for an example, you can um, look at this where you have two cats that are in your data set that come from the same augmentation. We make the adjacency matrix one where we know there's a relation, but we can be more general than this. We can also encode, you know, small values, smaller values than one. Um, for example, on the right-hand side, we, uh, you may know that two dogs are related, but not exactly related, so you still want them to have some overlap, but not fully overlapped, so you can also um, incorporate that in your data. Okay, so before we jump into um, any more details, I just want to go through some notation here because 
uh, it's easy to get lost in details without knowing the notation. So um, throughout, we'll use X to be our data matrix. This is all our inputs as some, um, in some matrix. The, these result in representations, um, which we denote by Z. And then uh, in the output, we will have a kernel vector or a kernel matrix. Uh, and we'll just put a star on that, a k to the star, to indi indicate that we're using the induced kernel or the output of the uh, training after self-supervised learning. And then one uh, thing that we'll just note is if you see a plus as an underscript on a matrix, that's just projecting onto the uh, positive uh, uh, eigenspace. Okay, so to do this task, we're gonna take three steps. Um, and these steps, I'm sure people are aware, are come in other kernel methods, but we'll, we'll follow the same direction. So uh, first we're gonna show that there is a, uh, in some cases, closed form solution. So there's a common form for this induced kernel. And then in some cases you can find closed form solutions that tell you some nice things about um, the self-supervised learning. And then outside of these closed form settings, we'll also show that you can often frame these problems as an optimization problem, um, sometimes in semi-definite programming. Okay, so uh, this probably isn't a surprise to anyone, but you, uh, in this case, will have a version of the representer theorem. So when you have a loss function of the form that we described here, which is some um, argument of your loss function plus a RKHS norm regularizer, then the solution will be of the form that we show below, um, where your induced kernel is basically some new matrix that's only a function of the kernel and the support of the data. Um, and this basically takes any uh, kernel problem and reduces it to an optimization task over your finite data set. Um, uh, so first let me go through a couple uh, closed form solutions of this. So here on I will assume all the data is given as one batch. So your loss function is one huge uh, matrix norm, or in this case, a Frobenius norm over a big matrix quantity. Um, in this case, this is the uh, analog of the Vickreg loss, which is, has two terms. The first term is a uh, term that enforces that your uh, matrix, your, your gram matrix is as close as possible to identity, minus the, um, when you de-average it. And the second term enforces contrastive pairs. So it says that when there is some relationship between data points, we want them to be as close as possible. And what you'll see in the closed form solution for this that we show at the bottom, uh, you have the uh, kernels on the outside between two new data points in your data set. A S here denotes the data set. And then you have something in the middle which basically uh, enforces the information quantity and the contrastive pairs. And we'll come to some intuition for how this works, but you can see that the um, loss function basically, uh, the, the closed form solution tries to produce a, a solution which enforces both this information gain and the uh, contrastive pairs. Uh, similar for contrastive loss, I think this one is actually a lot simpler. Here, our goal is we want our kernel matrix to be as close as possible to what's given by the adjacency matrix, and as you'll see, it, basically has a very simple form when you have one a data given as a single batch that you just invert your data in the data set and then you just want to make this as close as possible to I plus A. And that, as you see, is why it's in the middle of the, uh, of the two kernels. Um, so just to interpret this to give some intuition, um, here it's for the contrastive case if we are given two new data points, X and X prime. The uh, terms on the outside are sort of the closeness of your inputs, x and x prime, to the feature space of the SSL data set. And then the entry in the middle, the big matrix in the middle that I've uh, outlined in orange here, enforces the, uh, uh, the terms related to the contrastive terms. So it makes things close together when they should be and otherwise uh, not close together. And if people are familiar with ideas in metric learning, you'll, you'll see similar forms as well in, in that literature. Um, so before we, we had closed form uh, solutions when we trained over a single batch of data, but uh, you can also write your loss function as a function over many batches of data. 
Here we couldn't find a closed form solution, but we did note that you can write uh, this as a semi-definite program, as an SDP. I give the form below here for the contrastive loss. Uh, I don't have much more to say on this other than you can potentially solve this or use uh, tricks to analyze it, but uh, we just couldn't really find a closed form solution other than this. Okay, uh, so running to experiments now. Uh, we wanted to first, before we do any experiments on uh, larger data sets, we want to look at what happens when we use these kernels on a simple problem. And here we look at two spiral data sets. People typically use this as a classification problem, but we simply just said, let's see what happens when we use uh, the kernel and look at the induced kernel after we uh, look at this on a spiral data set. And I'm sorry if this is a bit blurry, but we're basically calculating the kernel between the point marked with the green X and other points in the data set. And as you'll see, if you use a typical RBF kernel, uh, without any SSL training, you have correlations that are close in the uh, R2 space. But when you do SSL, the induced kernel, you'll see that there's correlations picked up along the manifold of the data. Um, on the right-hand side, we, we use the bad augmentation. We, we, uh, we, the augmentations here are basically Gaussian noise, so we, try to, we correlate points that are close together in some region, in some ball. And you'll see that if you make that ball too big, then it doesn't really work. So um, just gave an example of how the augmentation is crucial to the performance of this. Um, sorry, just, just one point, and I'll come back to this later. This, there's a hypothesis in SSL that uh, uh, the augmentations create some manifold along the data, and this is part of the reason why SSL works so well. So this is uh, one, I guess, visual example of where we can see this in two dimensions. Um, so jumping into some very simple generalization analysis, uh, many quantities in uh, generalization in kernel methods is related to the norm of your solution and the RKHS norm. And we decided to see uh, if, uh, analyze this quantity here, which is related to that norm, which is we call um, SNK, which is basically a complexity quantity that you can be used to uh, bound generalization. And we wanted to see if uh, how this picture affects this uh, quantity, this complexity quantity. And again, going back to the idea here, this quantity, if, if you uh, believe this manifold hypothesis, this quantity is uh, minimized or made very small when the SSL kernel uh, correlates things that are, uh, that are on the same manifold. So if you have augmentations that produce some manifold of the data via those augmentations, if the induced kernel can capture those correlations, then this complexity quantity will be very small because it also will correlate things along the labels as well. Um, and just as a way to formalize this, uh, there's a very simple proof behind this, but if you have, uh, here we say if we have M negative one and M plus one manifolds in a binary classification setting, if the SSL induced kernel does what I just said, which is that it correlates points along manifolds and otherwise does not, so it sets the induced kernel to one when it's on the manifold and zero otherwise, then this complexity quantity is order one, which is in a sense optimal. And uh, we don't have any proof that this is like the data in the real world does have this form. I think that's some of the future work we'd like. But just to give you, we, we just wanted to say this to formalize some of the intuition behind why uh, such ideas that we have would, we'd expect to hold true. So jumping to some, uh, before I finish, jumping to some experiments that we did on, uh, here it's on MNIST, so kernel methods, we looked at the small data set samples of MNIST and then produced augmentations of that data set. And we compared the uh, induced kernel to uh, regular supervised training with or without these augmentations included. And what you'll see is that the performance is, you know, often in line or sometimes even better than the uh, supervised baseline. Of course, uh, the augmentation, though, matters. Uh, at the top here, we did a very bad augmentation, bad in the sense that it doesn't really work well with image data. And you'll note that the uh, induced kernel doesn't perform as well. Um, there's similar results for uh, convolutional neural tangent kernels. The previous slide was for RBF kernels, uh, but similar findings as well if you do um, other types of kernels. <clears throat> 
And finally, coming back to this generalization, this complexity quantity, uh, we also see that this uh, Self-supervised learning induced kernel does reduce this complexity quantity. I apologize, it's really hard to read this slide, but basically the, the point is that when you have the right hyperparameters, this quantity is, in a sense, uh, made very small, at least in comparison to the supervised baselines. So it may um, give one indication for the success of self-supervised learning in the kernel regime. Uh, I'd just like to end by thanking my co-authors. Um, thank you guys for listening to my talk. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Um, well, we got this oh, oh, yeah. um, let me just. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, how do how do these results compare to some um, you know to the all the semi-supervised learning algorithms? Laplacian based and other things like that. Yeah, um, I think much of the proof ideas and the techniques are shared. Um, our goal was to take those ideas and put them into the modern framework of self-supervised learning. From an empirical perspective, we didn't uh, compare much to those methods, but uh, our, our hunch is that they would perform probably better, if not similar. Um, yeah, our goal really was to like focus truly on the deep learning regime where these people people use this SSL for these deep networks. <laughs> <laughs>